Hi, hey, Paul. Hey, Ben. Hey, how you doing? I'm <laughs> Thank very you well. How are you? Very good. Thanks for joining us today. Um, James might be coming on later. He's having a bit of, bit of problems at the moment, but um, he'll be joining us if he can later. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. Um, and it's Pleasure. it's been a been a been a while. It has it has been a while. Yes, yeah. <laughs> six months or so. Yeah. So um, for anybody but, um, that's watching, uh, can you just give us a bit of background of for yourself and like your relationship with us and and how we know each other? Sure. Yeah. So I think that'd be good. Hi everybody. Okay. So hi everybody. My name is Paul McGee. Um, I'm a filmmaker. Um, which is probably why I'm on this platform. Um, when I say filmmaker, it's because I do most things an independent filmmaker would do. So I write, direct, produce, edit, the whole kit and caboodle, really. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is just, I think, part part of the part of the course these days. Um, which is great, though. I love doing all those things. So I'm perfectly matched to the thing that I, I do. Um, <laughs> I, I first met... Um, Ben and James, um, and lift off uh, back in 2011 um, at their it's inaugural. Back in the early days, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> the very early days. It yeah. was the inaugural um, lift off festival, and I entered um, my short film All Pinatas Go to Heaven into that festival, and it won. So, um, yay! I can call myself <laughs> an award-winning filmmaker. Um, yes, and that that kind of kick-started my drive towards doing bigger and more adventurous things in that the next project I took on was to write and direct my first feature film, mm -hmm. um, which has been a, 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 a hugely long journey because we're now in what now, 2019. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, mo it's mostly done. I mean, it's, it's out, it's released, it's great. And there's still things going on with it, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that release was just at the end of last year. So 2018. So this is, um, I mean, there are many reasons why we want to talk to you, but um, that's this is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you because you've been yeah. through the whole process of developing, producing, and probably most importantly, and often the most overlooked, the distribution side of mm. things. And yeah. you've had a very interesting um, route into that being, uh, you, are an, you are an Amazon um, Prime, right? Correct, if I'm correct, Indeed, Wait, we, yes. we, can, we can dig into the details of this of this later. Yeah. But um, so there's some some very interesting things. Um, and to give a little preface into this, really, I guess one of the biggest uh, failings. I don't like to use like negative phrases, but like one of the biggest uh, gaps, I guess, for young filmmakers that we come across is that um, there are plenty of amazing schools out there that teach them how to be great cinematographers, great directors. You can learn the art and the craft of filmmaking in many different, very various plethoras of ways. But the amount of people that come out of film school going, I have no bloody idea what to do once I've made a film is not acceptable. And it's absolutely mm. ridiculous <laughs> in in our in our in our at least in our um, experience of, of the people that we've come across again. And it's not a failing on their part at all. Um, it's more of a it's more of an industry change, I think, because mm. gone are the days where you make a film and then you just uh, you hope that somebody is going to take it on and um, you're going to have a long, long career. I mean, that might happen for some people, but now the days and the, and I think you might, you might be able to talk about this, the, um, the ability to, to develop, produce and to distribute your work with your own power and your own like creative network, if you like, is, yeah. is, is, is a brand new, is a brand new thing. Um, Especially and mainly because of the internet. So um, I don't know how can we how can we start into this? Perhaps uh, just tell us about your project first. I guess what is it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We can go. We can kind of chronologically go through this because yeah, yeah, it's been a it's yeah. uh, quite a long story. I suppose it's full of ups and downs. <laughs> and <things>. So <laughs> so the, the the story itself, the film is called Webcast, um, and it's a uh, found footage horror movie. 
Um, if I was to give you the elevator pitch, I would say it's about two young filmmakers who suspect their neighbours have uh, kidnapped someone, and they're holding them against their will. And so they start to run surveillance on them and then things go very badly, as they should do in all horror films. Mm. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's the crux of it. Um, yeah, how to begin? I agree with you. That that route of going through film school. Um, did you go to film see, school? I, no, I didn't. I did. I did mm. a media and cultural studies degree, which, to be honest, I'm not sure how that helped me very well. No, I did in some ways. It, I, it learned me some kind of decent what? digital skills that were worth having back in the day, like how to build mm. websites, how to do some creative writing classes and such. Um, mm -hmm. But the practical side of filmmaking wasn't at all in that course. Now that was mm. that was my choice at the time, but I think as I was doing that as a three year degree, by the end of it, the only thing I really wanted to do was go out and do something practical. Um, mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough that when I um, graduated, um, I made friends with a few people who kind of in my circle of friends anyway, but I don't think we knew each other that well back then. And it, it just turned out that they'd also, well, they were coming back from university. So they'd been to, um, other place in Bath, maybe my friend Matt, mm, um, mm. and he'd come back and he'd done. I'm not sure what his degree was, but he he wanted to go into television. He wanted to be an editor, um, mm. and he got he landed himself a job at a decent production house in London um, as a runner. Um, but very quickly he became a technical runner. Um, so mm. this is 2000. I'm going to say this is about 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. when you still you still couldn't shoot things on camera phones because they didn't exist um, yeah, and yeah. even like things like editing software weren't so readily available on laptops and things they would just melt mm. your computer because how uh, big they were <laughs> so um i got talking to him and he was saying yeah i'm working at this this production house it's got tons of equipment and i can use it all at the weekends for free and i said oh that's good because i want to make some uh. short films um and then off the back of that we kind of started we got roped in a few other people that we knew who were big um movie fans and thought may have some ambition into you know getting into film mm. um and we made we made i think maybe four or five shorts and the last of those shorts was all pinatas which ended up um winning the liftoff prize so that was a, a wonderful little journey and that's how i got into it so i had to be kind of incredibly proactive and kind of get mm -hmm. that thing going myself and i think actually if there is a core kind of theme that runs through the entire process up from from getting into film to making shorts to creating a feature uh getting that to a place where it's ready to push into the world and then mm -hmm. get distribution if you're not proactive about it nothing is going to happen like yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah, it's it's yeah, all on you. Yeah. It really is, um, and, yeah. it's, and I suppose that's kind of cuts what people, you know, the, the people that don't really have the passion for it, for the people that really do. Um, mm. So yeah, that's that's that was that's the history of that. So then I suppose going into the history of webcast itself and what I had to do for that was a bit different because by the time I wrote webcast which took uh nearly a couple of years i suppose the people mm. i had been doing that kind of job with um such as matt who was editing um they all had like really good jobs by then they were editing tv shows for channel 4 and bbc and things like that which is mm. great but it but it meant that they didn't have the time to jump onto mm -hmm. a feature project um so at that point, I knew that I was going to have to do a lot of that myself, get some people in um, who I hadn't worked with before, um, none of which, which was a huge problem. Um, mm. I think, goodness, there's so, many, there's so many ways to tackle this and get, get into it. I'm just trying to think mm. of the best, the best route. Um, so here's the thing, I suppose. You've got to know, before you even put pen to paper, in terms of thinking about a film, and I'm, I'm talking about a feature, I suppose, at this point. You could probably mm. apply something, something to a short. Something for the market. Something yeah, that you something, hope to find exactly. an audience for. Yeah, yeah, something you want to put out there that people are going to watch. And you know, We're talking about something that's roughly 80 to 90 minutes, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Even before you put pen to paper, you have to know who it is you're making that film for. You have to know that market. Now, I've been very lucky that Absolutely. as I've as I've gone into filmmaking, as I've become a filmmaker, it hasn't, and it, and it won't for, for many people, it, it hasn't, you know, um, 
funded my <laughs> my life. It hasn't funded my uh, <laughs> all the things I've done. I've had to have a job. Um, and it hasn't. Been, it hasn't been the dream star like stories that we all hear of. of no, somebody... I don't suddenly going from zero to a thousand yeah yeah i'm not quite those stories are actually a bit dangerous uh... they're a bit dangerous those stories because people genuinely believe that it's going to happen and then when it doesn't happen it means that they stop doing anything at all whereas as you just pointed out yeah. like you, you have to just keep going <laughs> Yeah, there's no, there's no other way around it. Yeah. And then the yeah. further you get into something, the more people are reliant on you to be to keep going as well. So yeah. you, you kind of have to, um, and that's yeah, it's the only way you get you get anywhere. So yeah, as I was saying that, you have to know that market. And I was lucky enough that I I worked in marketing. I did that as a as a day job for a while. Um, oh, I didn't realize still, that. Yeah, what kind of marketing? Yeah, and um, all sorts. I started uh, in music marketing. Um, uh -huh. working with kind of uh, indie bands uh, for a company. And that was kind of doing all their kind of street team stuff and things like that. And that was a cool thing to do. Uh -huh. um, and then um, actually, this is a crazy thing. Like when I made a feature film, in the same year I started making a feature film, I started a marketing company. Uh, really? Same year, yeah. And, and I think I got married <laughs> that year as well. So it's a massive year. So many things going on. Um, uh, yeah, but that was that was again that was more of a case of I had a couple of friends who did that too, and they had a network of people that needed people to work, f do their marketing for them. So mm. for me, I thought, well, this is great because it means that I'll be my own boss, so I can work my own hours, mm -hmm. um, which means I can actually do things when I want to do things and film things when I want to film things. Mm -hmm. There are there are drawbacks to that, and there there are pros and cons to that kind of thing. Um, yeah, for sure. Which I'm kind of, yeah, you have to balance things. It's very hard to find the time to do all these things. Um, yeah, you have yeah. To, you have to, again, you have to be proactive. You have to get up early and put in hours when you don't have hours before and things like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I feel like I'm drift on the subject. Yeah, so, so having a marketing or a sense of who you're making a film for is super important because there's no point in making a film. And I have this odd idea in my head that there are some people at film school out there that just think or even people who think they're going to make a film and it's just like i'm just going to make the thing i'm going to make i'm going to be the next david lynch and make mm -hmm. a dr dream logic film i'll understand it and everyone will think i'm brilliant mm -hmm. and it's like well it's not the case because david lynch has an audience he knows what he, mm -hmm. people who watch david lynch films know know his films 100 you know, so, yeah he's, yes he's found he's found a a, a, a niche if you like and mm. The reason the reason why people watch David Lynch films is because he's tapped into a specific thing that resonates with a certain section of the world, and that's essentially that's what marketing is, really, isn't it? It's like finding absolutely a, finding a thing that resonates with a group of people, and that's storytelling, mm. finding a a thing that resonates, because you could tell. I mean, we always get films. Um, usually from inexperienced filmmakers who, and you can tell that they've made it for themselves. And that's fine if it's a short, like a learning to make a short film. Mm. Um, if it's a, like a filmmaking exercise, but if they're going to spend money on trying to get it into festivals or like, um, or, or, the, or God forbid, a wider audience, then like, oh, hang on a minute, someone's ringing me. Sorry, James is ringing me, just one second. Sorry. No problem. Hello. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We're yeah, we're 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 in the middle of it anyway. We're 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 fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. Bye. 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 Yeah, James is in a. Sorry about that. James is in a uh, caf cafe, and uh, he's got a. A living room full of he's working from home today and he's got a living room full of babies right. so he's trying to find a cafe to uh do you you know james has had a baby do you know i that? do i saw i saw yeah. it on facebook it was a big surprise yeah, yeah. to me but i was like oh yeah. wow yeah, yeah like, that's oh. cool yeah <laughs> um so so he's he's in a in a big in a loud, big loud cafe and there's tons of people there and he can't like get anywhere to ah, do that's fine. this so anyway, where were we we were at um knowing marketing and knowing, oh, yeah, knowing marketing, your audience find, and finding a yeah. um, like a purpose 
I think. Mm, yeah, uh, you're story, right. Story, like a heart yeah. thing that resonates with people. Um, yeah. Cause... But so, how did um, how was that for you with uh, with, with webcast? Um, so the first thing I decided to do when I decided to make a feature is that I think I'd with my shorts, I kind of I'd riffed off the idea that I've watched enough movies that I know what a movie is. Like I mm. know what the beginning, the middle and the end of a movie is, but mm. I didn't think that I could just do that on 90 pages of a script. And that, that would, that would be successful. Um, mm. Maybe if I skipped back, maybe three or four years before that, I, tr I tried to write a novel. Um, and oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I have it still, it's like 300 pages long. Um, but I spent a huge amount of time on it. And when I was finished with it, I actually got to a point where I kind of got dejected with it in the sense that I thought, I don't think this is quite what it should be. And I put a lot of time mm -hmm. into it. Um, so I decided having put that on hold a long, long time ago, if I was going to do this again and dedicate a serious amount of time to writing, uh, I had, I had to know what I was doing in a way that I hadn't mm. done before. So I, I so what, yeah, so I thought, what did you think you didn't know what you were doing in terms of, in terms of the novel? What, what was it? Um, I think I just, I just, I just wrote it and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But then I think I would go mm. back, I maybe I'd write, I write a hundred pages and then I would stop, I would read back and I would start again. And it's a really, it doesn't work that way. Or maybe it was yeah. some people didn't work for me that way. And just, I don't know. I don't think it clicked well, and I was reading things, and then I go and see things. Go, oh, I've used that idea, so it's just it's a hackneyed idea anyway to do that kind of thing. There were there are lots mm. of things in it. I'm not saying I wouldn't go back to doing that at some point because it's a great way of telling stories, and it's a much more um, well. Obviously, it's a very personal thing to write a book as opposed to a film where it's mm. you know it takes a, a huge amount of people. Big team. Yeah, yeah. But the mm. the point was is that I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna. I'm going to read some how-to books. I'm going to go to some classes on screenwriting and that kind of thing. So I did. Mm. I bought some. I bought some key books on screenwriting. I went to Rain Dance's kind of short day courses or weekend courses on uh -huh. writing and filmmaking, which were quite helpful. Um, yeah, is it good? Well, good, worth it. Yeah, they were worth them? it. I would. I would recommend them. Like, I mean, they, yeah. they pitch those weekend courses. I think you can. You can get them on group on and things like that for maybe mm. 30 to 50 pounds they're not very expensive and mm -hmm. i i learned things on uh, i was only there for like three days but i learned things in there that i wrote in notes that i still know today and i still keep with me so it's, mm. those are well worth it they try to push you on to bigger courses after that that are really mm -hmm. quite expensive like six week courses at 350 pounds oh gosh this was like five or six years ago they're probably a lot more expensive now um yeah which I just, at that point, I was like, well, I'm going to make this film. And I knew I was going to make this film out of my own money. So then I was like, well, how much money do I want to spend on that kind of thing when actually I need that money for other stuff, like actually making it? For sure. So you have to balance that out. Um, but the point was, one of the books I got, which was called um, Thinking Outside the Box Office. Um, I don't know who it's by, actually. And it would have to be updated now, because this was talking about um, film at a time where digital was as a streaming service and as, and putting video on the web was at its real infancy, but they knew it was yes. there and it wanted to talk about that. And and in that yeah. book, it talked about that, that marketing structure and how like, you know, why was the Blair Witch so successful? Because it took something um, that was relatively new, um, the internet, and it used it really successfully to promote its mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, I started working on ideas that would be akin to that kind of marketing thing. I knew I wanted to mm -hmm. make a horror because in mm -hmm. horror you can make um, films with uh, actors who no one's seen on screen before. Um, yep. So you, your budget is low that end. Um, yep. You can be more experimental and more extreme and to kind of, horror gives you more, a more creative palette than the most other genres. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to make a found footage film because again, budget required that it was kept really low. Um, I'm, I'm talking the whole, the whole production of webcast cost about 7,000 pounds. So wow. that gives you, wow yeah, it's probably, wow it's probably topped up to about 10 now with 
marketing, marketing and trying to push it into the market yeah. and stuff. So you do need money for that as well. But yeah, yeah about that much. And um, so and this was yeah, so well, sorry. This, when when did you start uh, production? Just so I guess just so we get a sense of like the the, the, the yeah. technology states, I guess that you were. All right. So writing in two thousand and twelve, shooting started I think in two thousand and fourteen. Okay, so yeah. fairly, I yeah, mean, fairly right. recently then. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, but, so it's so it's so digital was nice, nicely established, and there were like cheap cameras around, and, uh, and yeah. people knew how to use them, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's all readily available for anyone out there yeah. really to find that kind of yeah. stuff, and it's reasonably yeah. priced now. So that was that. Um, yes, so I, so I knew it had to be those things going into it. So then I just decided, okay, well then I'm going to make a film that's about um people who 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 vlog on youtube and stuff like that they make webcasts mm -hmm. and so this story will at the center of it have a webcast that goes horribly wrong um and then the idea developed from there so it was what if um these two characters break into their neighbor's house um and did that live on on a webcast how could mm. yeah, what, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen from that and i think that um also kind of wrapped up with this concept of uh, a witch that lives next door it was a sentence that i remember very early on um mm. kind of brought everything together so that's that was the crux of the story and i thought well this is great because then also i can market this to people you know to a, to a youtube generation um mm -hmm. And that will relate in that sense. And although it's obviously the most difficult thing in the world now for any found footage other than the Blair Witch to promote itself yeah, as yeah. authentic, <laughs> um, this this would at least give it a nice buy-in story for people that like this genre. Because there's so many of these films being made, um, you have to have something that makes you stand out. And again, that's that's marketing. It's, it's the mm -hmm. ability to make mm -hmm. your film stand out amongst others out mm -hmm. because it's a very competitive marketplace um so that was the kind of the businessy side but then it became obviously more creative the creative with within that but it's interesting because the, i think that the as you said i think at the beginning like the two should come together or if you're if you're particularly got talent for that kind of thing they sh they can come together like the person we always say the person who's the primary drive, creative drive behind the film is the best person to market the film because they know, um, I'm just kind of repeating stuff really, but they know um, the core of the film, they know um, they know the, the themes in it, they know the characters, they know the threads, they know the different potential angles to kind of, to push to the market. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting was... way of thinking about it. Um, and I would have. I would, sorry, I, sorry, say, I would add good. one caveat to what you just said. Sure, sure. <laughs> which is you, you're completely no, right on all those, but that person yeah. then has to be checked at every stage of the way to make sure yes. that their idea isn't becoming something abstract. Yes. And I, yes, 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 I, I yes, that's yes, from yes. personal experience <laughs> of making the film, and there being moments where an audience has turned around to me and said, "What does that mean?" And then I've had to re-cut something like, so it may sense. Is it not obvious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's um, obvious, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been living with this for four years. It's, it's as obvious as the wall in front of me. But <laughs> yeah, so that's all true. But you need to balance it off for someone. And, and so, so that's, that's, that's testing. That's testing the market. And you should do that at the, the pitch level, the script level. Uh, the yeah. storyboard level make sure the thing yeah. you're making is obvious to the audience because they're the ones who are gonna at the end of the day buy it review it which means more people will hopefully buy it um so that's really important too so did you did you do um that testing yourself with, um, um, webcast? i did it i did it late on because i didn't know i didn't know at that point no um, sure, and sure sure also you, you get what's, very deep what's the, pro what's the production pro process What's the process of that? What is the, what would you, um, if you could go back and do it, what would you do? Oh, that's good. Well, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I've started doing it now with ideas for my next film in the sense that I've got mm. a handful of ideas. And the first thing is, is to boil them down to 
an elevator pitch. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I watched, I, I wish I had the link on me. Um, there's a YouTube clip out there, which is these, it's, I think it's Hollywood producers, a couple of them, or maybe screenwriters, who are talking about the one piece of advice they would give to new filmmakers. Okay. And it's, if you can't get, get a post-it note and write down your story on a post-it note. And if you can't, then you're not ready to tell people about the, your film. 100%, yeah. And that's like... They, and you, I, they, they're not going to listen to you for longer. You, yeah, you, you to, can... To read yeah. a piece of A4. <laughs> you can watch people yeah. lose interest as you say three sentences about your movie. So that's, yeah. you, you should, that, that's the first place to test it, is to go to people and go, oh, this is the idea I have for a new movie, or these are the ideas I have, and see which one they latch on to. See, oh, well, that's... Because mm. actually, the other thing is, some people might go, oh, I've seen that before. So, and you may not have, but then that gives you mm. kind of, a, and kind of, oh, okay, so that idea has been done before. Maybe I can mm -hmm. do it differently, or maybe I should leave it alone because it's something that's been done too many times. Um, yeah, so that, that testing, I think, you, there's never an earlier place to start than as you're cultivating the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then uh, at the script level, did you say? Yes, at the script level, you can do the same thing. Um, I personally for webcast, I had a few people read the script. I had um, a friend of mine who's also um, an aspiring filmmaker who's made some shorts and stuff and has, has written a feature. We did a we we did a, we did a swap where we just read each other's scripts and gave each other notes, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, and he he put in some really good um, points that I needed to take on board that actually did make it to the final script. Um, the one thing I didn't do. Um, which I think is a really good thing to do is a read through. Uh, so these are the things that I now know would be great to do second time around. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Cause then you get a sense of things like dialogue and how things work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I th yeah, I think you can continually do that. And even to the point where if you have time on set and you're shooting to shoot a scene um, and then allow the actors maybe to have a look at playback um see if they want to try again i mm. kevin smith does this and i thought it's a really good point when i heard him talking about it because you know most most actors um i, I from from my experience directing actors i just like to mm -hmm. make actors feel as comfortable as possible so they can be as creative as possible um sure but if i get them to check it they might go i want to do it one more time like I can do, I can yeah. do that better, and so that, that, that's almost like a uh, a little exercise in, in getting the best out of them. But again, you know, you're checking things along the way. Yeah, for sure. And some actors won't like that. Some will. Um, mm. It depends yeah. on their their process. Some some are like, no, I never watch myself ever. <laughs> but um, some are, some will some will watch it out of like morbid curiosity. <laughs> but then you might get some. <laughs> You might get some that will, uh, will. I mean, they're in their performance, right? And then they will be able to understand what they're trying to do. And if they mm -hmm. see it back, um, it's a tricky one because, like, do you want the actor to give the performance that you want them to give or that they think that they should be giving? I don't know. It's a, it's a, fine, it's a fine line. But um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the more options you have in the edit, the better, I guess. Yeah, I think that's it. Got, yeah. Uh, every every actor has a different way of doing things, and yeah. you have to be very um, ready for that um, yeah. and, and respond, and respond positively. Well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to be doing what they're doing with a bunch of people yeah. around them going, go on. Act, um, which is not how I direct you, by the way. Uh, but yeah, um, you should. So I would, I would go. <laughs> yeah, now, now, act now. Um, Have a stick. So, uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I'd give them that option. I'm not going to force them to do it. They wouldn't want to do it. But um, yeah, it's. I like. I like. If I'm if I'm going to do takes, and I've got enough time for takes because that's the other thing is when you're filming, you never have enough time. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But, to get get the script down, I, I really like getting an ad libbed version down for for natural dialogue, um, mm -hmm. 
And then if there is time, just to play around with it from there, if they've got anything they want to throw at it. And then, you know, mm -hmm. coverage. Get as much coverage as you can of things like that, if you have the time. And if not, well, that's, that's you know, again, that's what um, doing script readings are for. You know? mm -hmm. I, rem I remember reading about um, Whiplash, um, the film Whiplash. Mm. Da is it Damien Chazelle? Is it the director? Yeah. The writer? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that J.K. Simmons was really impressed by is that David Chazelle knew exactly like how he wanted things framed, and he didn't stray from that. So he wasn't about all the coverage in the world. He was no, like, no, yeah. this is this is this I, is a close. -up. I know this it already. Right. Yeah. yeah. In my, in my, I don't. I don't need anything else because I've I've planned it. Yes, yeah. it's so, not going to work. <laughs> but that's perfect, yeah, because then he's got yeah. great actors doing what they need to do, and he, yeah. you know, he knows where everything's going to be. So, again, I thought we'd come a little bit away from sense-checking work, but those are all things. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's no... Um, I think it is important to highlight that there is no um, black and white, and there's no right and wrong, and mm. uh, a tool is a tool, and if it's not doesn't work, then get rid of it. It might work for somebody else. Um, people get really hung up on these things sometimes, like should, what's the right way to do it? The right way is whatever works like for you in the moment. Yeah, so, yeah, don't let, it, don't let it mess with your head. Like, you yeah, can find and also, out also people, people get too far ahead in the planning, like have mm -hmm, some stuff mm -hmm. to try out and then learn from it i think it's, it's like actually do it <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I i'm a big fan of like learning the form um because once you know the rules then you know how you can break the rules yeah 100 percent. yeah i think so, so that was the same with the writing all the processes so um end of the day and end last shot it's cut then you go through the editing process you've got a finished that's an entire like conversation in itself, I'm sure. But um, mm. Mm. when, but you get to the process where you have a, um, and perhaps this what I'm about to go on to, perhaps that weaves into whilst you're editing it, it's editing it as well. But um, you have a finished product. What then? Good question. What then? Um, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath because your journey is only halfway complete. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I tell most people. <laughs> Now, now the real work starts. Yeah. Um, now what? So what you've got to do now, and actually, I'm pretty sure that one of the first pieces of advice I got on the now what was from you guys. Um, I think James sat me down and took me through some tips uh, on what I needed to do. Um, oh, cool. You've got to, yeah, you've got, I mean, you've got to market your film. Um, mm. And that process, again, cannot start early enough. If you didn't think mm -hmm. you had enough things to do with writing the script and getting things done, um, making people aware that you're making a film is the best way to start the marketing journey towards getting your film noticed. 100%. Here's the, here's the thing, I suppose. It's like um, it's like you're on one side of, uh, I don't know, um, a river and uh, distributors on the other side of the river. There you go. And you've got to find a way for them to notice you and build a bridge to that point, right? And mm -hmm. the only way to do mm -hmm. that is 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 through marketing your film and building an audience so when it when you come to the point where you get to the distributor you can go hey look i've got this many people already excited about my film i've got them mm -hmm. saying these things on social media about it i've got them mm -hmm. talking about it to their friends um maybe you've done some test screenings and you've filmed responses of people i've got this i know this works um you've got to you've got to do all of those things you've got to start building it so you're going to need you've cut your film great but you're now going to need to cut a trailer because that trailer needs to be the thing that people hook into mm -hmm. um you've got to be able to then um make people follow you all over your social platforms mm -hmm. um maybe even get them on a marketing an email list if you can mm -hmm. um lots of ways of doing that maybe you offer them certain things it's kind of weird now because there's gdpr which means you can't keep yeah. hassling people in certain ways so that well let's ignore the email list for now the social media thing is is there and ripe and ready to use and you mm -hmm. can access it and other people can access it uh so a distributor or a sales agent they'll be able to see what's going on with the film and, and how well it's doing how many views the trainers clocking up um mm -hmm. things like that um posters got, artwork 
Post an artwork. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Strangely, yeah. I, it was only the other day I realised I haven't got one single, um, what's the word, uh, kind of real printed posters of webcasts. I've not had to do it yet at all. But oh, really? they're all they're all online. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I've made hundreds of digital posters for, for webcasts in different <laughs> forms, starting right from the beginning, just to pitch what the thing was. Um, actually, even even convincing, because um, the actual the story, not the script, but the story that it came from, um, I co-wrote that with a good friend of mine who's still involved in the project, uh, Chris Shaw. And he wasn't sure of the name, uh, webcast. It wasn't until I showed him mm. it on a poster in a certain font, and it was like, "Oh, oh yeah, really? I get it now. That's it interesting. works." Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, yeah. yeah, even a name has to be pitched through a poster. But yeah, you're going to need to yeah. use so many visuals. Um, one massive tip: if I could go back in time, I had a photographer I think come out like one day of shooting, and mm -hmm. I think they lost most of their images. So I, I had, I had hardly any footage uh, photography footage of the film mm. um mm -hmm. so i had to use a lot of stills a lot of uh, kind of screenshot stuff um from mm -hmm. the actual footage i already had which is it's fine but it's all a bit low grade um mm. i would say if you're going to shoot anything this is something i'm definitely doing when you're blocking out a scene with actors or the first time they do it because the first time is oh wow uh, if you get a take that's great first time around it does happen but it doesn't happen that often um mm. Just, just shoot the thing with a real with a real camera the first time round. So you're going to have loads and loads of stills that you can use. I didn't have that. So uh, that's a good idea. Use, yeah, because if you end up with a bag, you end up with the whole film in stills as well, high high res mm. stills. So mm. I would definitely do that next time. Short film, long film, doesn't matter. Do that. You'll have lots of things you can use. Um, mm. Yeah. So I, I I used all the screenshots I could. I put them with. I, I sent the film out to. Um, I think I sent it to a list of about 25, 30 um, horror bloggers, horror reviewers, um, mm -hmm. a certain ilk. And by that, I mean, you. I mean, by all means, send it off to people who are massive in this world, but they get stuff every mm -hmm. day and they may not see mm -hmm. your stuff They, because you know, you're just another email and a long list of emails. Um, mm -hmm. If you start with people who have a certain level of, of, of kind of viewership, maybe they have a thousand followers on Twitter or Instagram, not like 25,000, uh, and you contact them directly and ask them, would you know, pitch your movie to them, do the elevator pitch and give them a link or say, would you like to watch it? I can send you a link. Um, I had six or seven get back to me. Um, and and they all gave me a review. And I, I, not just did they give me a review, because the film was still two years away from actually seeing the light of day in terms of a public release. Um, mm. But I, said, I, sh I showed them a trailer I cut, and in that trailer I was going to put you know, positive reviews. And it would be like, insert review here, then person uh, okay. insert thing here. And I sent them that, and I said, <laughs> I need reviews to put in this trailer. So they knew that that was going to be a payoff for them as it was for me because their review I and see. their name was going into the trailer. That's nice. So, That's very nice. yeah. So then they were going to get free advertising off of whatever I put out mm. there. And mm. I was going to get, well, I wasn't, I wasn't bribing them for a positive review. They weren't all, you know, nine out of tens. Um, uh -huh. they were fair reviews, which is great, which is fine. Um, mm. I obviously pick the best ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that worked for me. And that was just something I, I learned along the way. You can trade off of that kind of thing. And then once those people uh, learn about it, well, then you can take it to people with a slightly higher uh, readership or following because you can go, well, all these people have liked it. Maybe you'd like it too. And you can carry on that process. Um, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't carry on that process at that point because I think – off of the back of doing that, and then I stuck a trailer on uh, Facebook. I put it everywhere, uh, YouTube, um, Twitter, and I put it on Facebook, built a page for mm -hmm. it and everything. And then I, I threw some uh, Facebook ad money at it. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a lot. I mean, I think I put like £10 a week on it for mm -hmm. three or four months. So mm -hmm. it didn't feel like a massive expense. It was quite yeah. manageable. 
But I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, it's a great thing to use for this because you can target the right people. So I was targeting people that for sure. talk yeah, to it's very, very the Blair Witch Project. And yeah, yeah mm -hmm. people uh, that liked found footage. And, and this is something I actually, um, I've learned even in the last three months since the film's been released is actually that targeting, you want to be as specific as possible because first of all, I was targeting just horror fans. They all, respond, mm -hmm. they all responded really well to the trailer. But I don't think everyone in that who watched that trailer understood that it was a found footage film. So some mm. of the reviews I got when it came out were, uh, well, fortunately, a lot have been good, but the ones that were bad were devastatingly bad. But it was almost these people were like, oh, oh, it looks like it's been shot by a by a child. Uh, they can't even hold the camera <laughs> properly. And you're like, that's, that's, that's what found the whole footage point. is. But they, <laughs> yeah, but these people didn't know that, and they get angry enough that they're going to write something negative online, and then like, you have to counteract that if you can. So when you target, so I, I've learned that. So now all my targeting that I do for it is like, it's found footage, horror. So if you like that, mm, hopefully great. you'll like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so you have to do all that targeting. I also I was I was fortunate enough. I had advice from you guys. Uh, I also have a really excellent um, lawyer who's a BAFTA member. Who mm -hmm. just again, this is another thing that happens when you're making a movie. You go around telling people you're making a movie. You wouldn't believe the amount of weird connected coincidences that happen, and people you meet and end up having mm. you know friendships and professional relationships with. Um, my mm -hmm. my wife's lawyer was the BAFTA lawyer. Uh, my wife isn't in film. Um, but she worked with with um, my lawyer Angela Jackson before, and had noticed in a Skype conversation that that she had a, a red carpet picture like on her wall, and she was like, "Oh, right. what's that? Have you been to the movie?" She was like, "I'm a BAFTA member." So by the time it oh, came wow. that I needed yeah. advice on who I could take this to, I I, mm -hmm. I had her in my corner because she was representing me then. So she put it out to a few people, a few distribution people. Um, I got. Um, I got one distributor just contact me through Twitter, having seen all of the work I've been doing socially to promote the trailer and all the bits mm -hmm. of the film. Um, mm -hmm. I one of the actresses, uh, or sorry, actor in my movie, uh, Nikki, uh, who's brilliant. Well, they're all brilliant. Nikki's been in in acting. It's her career. She's been there for about 30 years um, and mm. she trained with uh, Kenneth Branagh and, and um, that kind of class of, of, mm -hmm. of actors. Um, so she knew people as well, or she was working, I think she was working on a, another job after webcast, spoke to someone. He said, oh, I know uh, a distributor um, and got me, you know, so I got in contact with someone through that. Again, you have to be proactive with this. You also have to find distributors on the web who already distribute your kind of movie um, yeah 100%. and you can go to them yeah, as well that's that's a that's a huge that's a huge point <laughs> yeah yeah so you've got mm. to talk to people in the business you've got to contact people directly you've got to just make a real racket about your film and how great it is and how they definitely need to see it and how they are going to be able to sell it because they need they're not even i suppose i mean they do care about the story but the buzz that your film can make is the thing that's going to sell it for them sure and that's and that's their business um mm -hmm. so yeah I, I ended up um with uh so one distributor i i, I was cl well, this is the other thing so this is now the bit where things the process slowed down because this is 2016 and i was mm -hmm. like yes this is ready it's going to be out in no time it'll be fine but then uh, things happened in the sense that the first distributor was painfully slow in getting back to me every time I corresponded. Um, like mm -hmm. it took a month or two weeks to get an email response. So I decided I don't think I want to work with you because I think so it might you... be a pain. <laughs> Sorry, go on. So were you talking to one at a time? Or were you, were you targeting one and you were trying to like – you had a, I had a, I had a one that you were like this. I want to work with this, this group, and then yeah, yeah. I think I was talking to maybe one or two at any one instance. But what would happen? It would be a case of okay, so I'll talk to this one. Okay, this sounds great. Um, but then other things. Oh, yeah, actually, no. Other things happened in the sense that my solicitor informed me that I had to get all my legal documents in place at this point, and I hadn't mm. done that. It's really yeah, annoying. Yeah, you have yeah. to do it. 
It's a huge, yeah, that's another <laughs> another big learning point. Definitely one highlight. Yeah. Because yeah. you Cause just a... shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. What, so really... run, run through run through them for us, if you can, if you can just quickly. What, what oh, should okay. people get together at the beginning? Okay. So you've got to have someone on set the whole time getting clearances from the people you're working with, from the locations mm -hmm. you're working with. Don't say you're going to do it later. Don't say you'll get them on another day because running around after people on another day is an entirely other job when you could just get mm -hmm. them to sign it. They're there that day, get them to sign it. Uh, I did that for 95% mm -hmm. of it, so I only had to chase a few people. That wasn't too bad. Uh, yeah, get your mm -hmm. locations signed off because uh, that's, again, really important because if you don't and someone complains that their location is in your movie later, that could be horribly expensive in a, in a lawsuit. Um, mm -hmm. What else do you need? You need music sign off. So I can't remember all the technical names for these things, but you need uh, oh, a music cue sheet is what you need, uh, which you can mm -hmm. go online and you can find a template for quite easily. Um, but that that I mean, that's really technical. It's stuff like who who wrote this, who composed it for your film or what version are you using? Mm -hmm. Who owns the license? You know, where is it playing in your movie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you're going to need one of those. They all sign off mm -hmm. on those things too. Um, those are the big three off the top of my head. Um, and what about is, um, QC um, as well? Or is it QC? QC? Quality, uh, I can't remember what it's, maybe I'm making it up, but there's a there's a thing that sales, sales agents asked for. Perhaps it didn't apply because it was a found footage where um, it's a list of Different. Um, it's just a, basically a deliverable package where there's different renders in different codecs and different um, things that they can send out. But yep. they have to they have to pass like quality check for like uh, sound, quality check for picture, quality check for all of these different things. Yeah, yeah. They give you a list. They're actually, when they when yeah. they when they give you an agreement, there is the usually the last page of your agreement is a deliverables sheet, the things mm -hmm. they're going to want after signage. And when they want them by mm -hmm. yeah that's all on there those are those those things are actually relatively easy to accomplish in the sense mm -hmm. that if you've been using video editing software the software you're using should have all the formats for you to get things to that point mm -hmm. as long as you have made a reasonable attempt at, at making good quality within the thing that you've shot so maybe mm -hmm. it's fine I, I suppose it must be fine on a on a smartphone camera because there are films out there that are shot on smartphones. Yeah, um, yeah. You probably you probably have to do a few things though. You probably have to use something like Filmic Pro because it gives you more kind of um, it, well, it's it's more specific to how you could tune an image before you shoot. Also, maybe you need to shoot at least I imagine in 1080 at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but most cameras do that now automatically. Mm. That shouldn't really mm -hmm. be a problem. I used mostly for my film. I used um, a Canon 5D Mark II, mm -hmm. so I was I was shooting in in 1080 the whole time, um, and I also used a zoom mic uh, to pick mm -hmm. up sound. So because audio is a massive thing, um, we well, I mean, this could be an entire crash course in filmmaking. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you can uh, in found footage, your your image can look as as, as shit as as, as necessary mm. people will watch as long as they understand what's going on by audio if your audio is is bad no one mm. is going to sit and listen to hums and beeps and and things mm -hmm. like that so you know as audio is more important than visual in a lot of ways in that sense so anyway, yeah, but sure. i i had all that was all stuff that i i could work out and formulate within the editing program and export so that wasn't a problem um so the first distributor, I had to get all this sign off stuff going on. That ended up being a process that took ages. It took like three or four months to do. By the time I got back to the distributor anyway, who I wasn't that sure about, they said their model had changed because they were offering DVD release and streaming to a number of places in the world. But because the DVD market had shrunk, they were now mm. only offering UK distribution. Mm -hmm. While they were only offering UK distribution, I'd already spoken to someone who contacted me on Twitter, another company, who were dead excited about it, and they said they could do UK distribution. And I felt like, well, they're... D they're DVD, DVD? No, sorry, uh, just streaming distribution. Oh, no, and DVD. DVD. Yeah, and DVD. 
yeah um so i was like well if it's going to be uk i think i'd rather go with these guys because they seem more excited um mm -hmm. it was one particular person working with that company who who i was talking to and he, he said wait if we're going to have a found footage film this is the found footage from all the plot on. Um, mm -hmm. Which is the same as what the other distributors said. In, in terms of they were all singing high praise for the film. So I knew mm -hmm. I had something that was good, which mm -hmm. is nice to have that feedback from someone who has to sell something, uh, sell your actual yeah. product. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, the, so, the first, <laughs> yeah, so the first one I got by the wayside, here was the second one. Um, whilst I was speaking to them, I had, a, I had like a global uh, distribution company um, who kind of only focus on found footage kind of contact me as well. So this is all over like another six month period, I suppose. What happened was here, and this is the thing that can happen with distribution deals. If you get an offer and such, just sit tight. Mm. It might not work out. Um, mm. the, the, the UK ones, I'm sure they're a great um, distributor agency. They also run a festival. It's all dedicated to horror. So it's really good. Mm -hmm. However, on the day, this is literally the day that I had taken all those deliverables and put them on a hard drive and mm -hmm. was going to the post office to send them. I got an email from them saying they were having cash flow issues and because of it, they were terminating all kind of future prospects. <laughs> agreements. Really? Wow. So, yeah, so I, well, yeah, did, they, did they go bust or? No, they're still out there. They're but, still but they, around, but they, they were just scaling they, back their operations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I spoke to the person who I had been my point of contact with them, and in the two weeks since I'd spoken to him, he had gone from being a permanent member of staff to a freelancer, but also right. uh, he had basically said to them, you cannot keep acquiring movies because you yeah. don't have the money to market them all. Um, yeah. So... It's a good thing, I suppose. The other thing about most distribution deals and the contracts you sign is most want a 10-year contract out of you. I think the minimum mm. is five-year, but lots don't want to do a five-year contract. So mm. you have to be sure. You have to be sure because these people are going to be responsible for your movie. For probably long, well, it should be longer than it took you to make it. Um, mm. And it's, it's, so it's a long time. You want to be in with the right people. So that was two distributors down. Um, I had a, a third one who was global, and I said, "Well, look, the UK rights just came up as well. So, do you want to? Do you want that?" Uh, yes, they they wanted it. They wanted it all. <laughs> and this is where it gets <laughs> to the, the other thing that out of that checklist of like things you need legally, um, they wanted. They said, "Oh, oh, this all looks great. The only thing you need to do now is get E and O insurance, which yes, is errors." That's the one. Uh, yeah and emissions that's the one. yeah errors and emissions insurance so i was like okay fine um found a company there's only a couple of companies in uh uk i think who do it anyway so I, just I found, run us run us run us through what the no insurance is <laughs> it's errors and emissions insurance i'm so glad you asked me that today because i walk around most of the time forgetting what the E O stand for <laughs> <laughs> errors, <laughs> errors and emissions insurance covers you in case um you shot someone, someone sues you. yeah someone sees you basically it's a very expensive process um so yeah you know if someone's in the background of your movie hey i didn't give you permission i'm suing you that kind of thing yeah um yeah. i'm i'm sure most courts would take anything like that responsibly they're not going to try and destroy you for it but you are going to have to pay some recompense if that happens you don't have it and so, the distributor yeah, I, wants the insurance to to mitigate the liability, right? To like or absolutely. mitigate the risk, mitigate the risk yeah. of it. Yeah, because they totally. they're taking on a portion of the risk by acquiring the rights. So if like if you've yeah. if you've we've um, we had this with a with a documentary, um, and uh, it was it was about a homeless street artist in Vancouver, and um, and he was on. It was a it was a documentary that they they followed him around for like five years filming and they became mates and they were like um for, but but it was a huge issue because he wouldn't sign the release saying oh, like no. oh it's fine you can use use my thing so that just made the eno 
ensure it's impossible because like the, the central character um, of this documentary was just like a massive risk because if he turned mm. turned around and was like, even though they were friends, if he turned around and said, no, this is uh, this is painting me in a really bad light and it's like, it's, it's a huge, it's too big of a risk for anyone to take, mm. but it all turned out right. It all turned out well and he ended up signing and the you know, insurance went through. But um, well, that's good. these are the things, these are the things that filmmakers don't realize when they start. No. And no. if you know them at the beginning, then you can cause, you can save yourself a hell of a lot of pain at the end. So true. So true. I suppose, yeah, looking back on it, I don't mind because that's what this, this was a learning curve through feature filmmaking for me. So for sure. yeah, but now I know. A anyway, I got the quote back and it was like 3000 pounds and it was like my whole film cost seven or eight grand i don't yeah. i didn't have <laughs> the three grand um yeah. to pay for this so that they kind of put an end because they they held on for a while and i was like well i don't have it and then um i think by the time i actually did manage to raise the funds um they they had moved on um mm. which was which was gutting um so at that point um i decided well i've done this whole process kind of uh diy style up until this mm -hmm. point i i might mm -hmm. as well distribute self-distribute or find out about that and then go down that route this is um, going to be my my yeah. question what this is one of my mm. questions to you what did you feel that these uh companies that you were talking to what did you feel feel they could bring you that you that wasn't in your um ability to 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 make happen um i suppose they have relationships with buyers is the most yeah is the biggest thing um yeah if it's hard to find these people unless you already have relationships with them i'm pretty sure actually when one of those deals fell through i think i think i even I think I text james and said do you know anyone at netflix <laughs> like <laughs> I kept my film in front of anyone at netflix and his response was no it's like a secret society and yeah. they only do these things and that things um so I, I i knew i needed those people i suppose at that point but so, so you already... had sorry so you had aspirations for your for the distribution of your film and mm. you and these companies that you were trying to connect with um would would provide a route into that into yes. that desired future yeah Okay. Yeah, I, I think my first ambition for the film back in 2012 was a theatrical release. I think as mm -hmm. the years went on through making it, the the world of film has changed. That's almost impossible, mm -hmm. um, unless unless it's just a marketing gimmick. But then you need the budget behind that to actually get mm -hmm. those screenings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was that access. It was it was being able to actually speak to people and go, well, "We think your film could make this much." at the low end and this much at the high end mm. um yeah we know it's hard to say we know the supermarkets to put your film in which is a yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah only one, actually only one company who, who shot something and um even before they took it to festivals they got a deal with walmart in the us that, that mm. paid for the entire film they didn't need to take mm -hmm. it to festivals after that they were like well it's done it's going to make money now mm. so it's, mm -hmm. it's odd it's weird how a different <laughs> different supermarkets in the uk offer different things for different genres i think it's like asda is the biggest dvd retailer <laughs> retail uh, re reseller for um horror so it's just that's yeah, yeah that's, well, that's the go. world of 2019 <laughs> so strange <laughs> um whereas whereas like waitrose is classic <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so it was that network but then I, I just i just thought well so you decided to diy it yeah because also i had i had these this core group of actors who've been working with me now for like three years who i was mm. we've become really good friends and mm. would would hang out together on weekends not shooting this is way after you know and just you know talking mm. film and just uh, spending time together having fun um mm. and so i was like i have to i have to get this out because these people mm. actually their career might go somewhere further with this out there. I need to do mm -hmm. it. So that's a nice way of that was, it. And it's true. It's very true. It's true. And again, this is yeah. that proactive and the fact that the further in you get, the more people are behind you, but 
then that ge- that means you are now responsible for actually delivering something. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, th- these people, you know, and these people believe in your story and you, and they're only going to get paid travel and food money. So mm. that you know, and some of them would come out in the middle of the night in January in the woods and shoot stuff and go home and have mm. a cold for a week. Mm-hmm. You, you owe it to these people for the film to, to be out there in, in the world. So, yeah, I read up a lot about Amazon, um, and the process seemed fairly straightforward. Again, in that terms of uh, quality check we were talking about earlier, Amazon has that mm-hmm. entire quality check in place. So if you were just curious to see if your film would make that quality check, you, you can run mm-hmm. it through their video service, and if they throw it back and say it's not good enough, then you know you need to to work on that um they also have all the specs on there as well so if you're thinking of shooting something look at those specs first mm. um yes so uh i decided to go down that route and pick a decent time of year when it would happen and i it was so, weird because so, I, it, cool. so did you use an aggregator or did you like uh, did you contact amazon directly i went through amazon's direct service which is all online direct i service. didn't speak yeah to, I think it's called Amazon Video Direct. I think is 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 the, mm-hmm. uh, the website to go on. And it's a uh, you know you sign into an account, and you get your things going and green tax stuff, whatever it is, um, and then you pull the stuff up, including like uploading your film in ProRes, which is like over a hundred gig and takes three days. Yeah. <laughs> your um, but yeah, you get all that done. Um, it's, it's a very easy process to go through to be honest as long as you know, all, the, all the stuff is there showing you the resolutions what your poster should look like etc etc mm-hmm. so it's very intuitive very easy to do and you, know, you can use those posters for other things as well so it you know, adds up more, more marketing stuff for you to have more assets um i didn't go through an aggregator because they're expensive and i didn't have the money mm-hmm. for it um, mm-hmm. that's why it's not currently on itunes or google play because mm-hmm. aggregators yes. The only way into that yeah. yeah, Apple did have a service like Amazon, and the, the link is still available, but I got into there, and it was one of those continuous loops of clicking on one thing, going back to the same page. It doesn't work. Um, mm. I don't think they, they don't care. They, well, they want aggregators to do it. Um, so where does that bring me? So that's December 2018, three months ago now. I launched the film uh, to the world through Amazon, in, well, yeah, to the, in the US and, and the UK. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'd actually managed to DIY the entire film from conception to release. But that wasn't the end of the story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because obviously, once I'd released it, I thought, well, that's that's the end game for this now. I just have to do some kind of, you know, continual marketing. marketing in the background so people watch it people review it etc etc mm-hmm. but two two things happened a couple of weeks after i released it one was a film festival contacted me saying they really wanted to show webcast um and i thought mm-hmm. i thought like it missed its festival window of opportunity because it was already out in the public domain but they mm-hmm. were a found they were a found footage horror festival in san francisco oh, great perfect the perfect audience for it. Um, so two weeks ago, I went over to that. Um, and so it was the first time that the, the webcast had been shown on an actual big cinematic screen. So I got a theatrical mm-hmm. screening. It it killed. Everyone loved it. It got massive buzz and attention. <laughs> um, and it may it may it may have won something, but I uh, I couldn't possibly say until that's actually common knowledge. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and um, <laughs> and the other thing that happened was a sales agent got in contact with me and said, oh, "I've seen your film on IMDb. Um, I need to. I'd love to watch it." And I was straight up front. I went, "That's great." I went, "It's available." Already been released. Yeah, I was yeah. Like, it's been it's been it's available in the US and the UK on Amazon, but the rest of the rights for for the world are still up for grabs. Right, so if you're you're, grabs, you're yeah. happy with that, then please do. And he was like, "No, absolutely, I will." Um, he watched it. He really liked it. Again, he saw that Blair Witch angle, the elements um, that might work there. Um, funny enough, that's a sales agent company run by someone who's in marketing, so he knows things from that sense. So you can see how all these things come together. 
Um, yes. And, and I finally signed an agreement last week. So the film oh, actually wow. now has representation for the rest of the world and may still have representation for other formats in the US and the UK in the future. Um, and on top of that, one of the things that may happen off of the back of this is one of the processes we may go down to make the film more of a viable product to sell globally is work out how to do a very small theatrical release in the UK, maybe four uh, or so screenings. So all the things I wanted to happen okay. that I didn't think were going to oddly have happened <laughs> ever since I decided that I was just going to do the whole thing by myself. Um, so, so yeah, sorry, I missed that. I missed, I missed the significance of the last bit. So the, so you're, you're going to do a, a small theatrical release in order to do to do what? To make it more viable in the US, did you say? To make it more viable globally as a product, because it's then right. a film, it's a UK film that's had a UK theatrical had a UK release. release. So, yeah, so that's, some, that's, that's, yeah, so we're still so working on pipeline. that. That's in the pipeline, yeah. Yeah, but, but in terms of like, I mean, and again, this is like low budget stuff. Things yeah, that course. are weird that work out, I, I went to San Francisco and I wouldn't have been able to have done that unless I'd released it on Amazon and it had made enough money on Amazon to pay for my flights out there. So it's like, it's all this small piece stuff that comes together and actually <laughs> gets you where you want to be. So yeah, that's, that's where the webcast is in March of 2019. It's, it's in good hands well, with other people. Well, congratulations. Um, I just you. I just brought it up on Amazon Prime now. Um, what's yes. really interesting to me with Amazon Prime is that, um, and I predict that they may take over Netflix. I know that's a bit of a big bold statement to make, but they are. I mean, they're two different. They're two totally different things. So perhaps that's a bit premature. But the part, the thing that it gives to filmmakers, you've been able to release it in the US and the UK where people can purchase it and how does sorry how does the um uh how does the how does this, the distribution model work so did you pay a fee to list it and then you take a percentage of the revenue or is it's completely free to list it um, uh -huh. so there's no money there and then i think it works something like 60 40 to the filmmaker it's they, they've, they've slashed it horribly from last year apparently it used to be a lot better than that um oh, really yeah so it's i mean it's it's about 1p per hour streamed um so you have to work at it really hard or really cleverly mm -hmm. really smartly in terms of your mm -hmm. ads to get the right people and things like the reviews really really count so mm -hmm. people giving it good reviews that, that helps it on their algorithm and then obviously it comes up on more people's menus mm -hmm. and then they see it and it, it self generates like that. I am in so a you, so you have the two sorry, you have the two things, right? You have the free um the viewer can watch it for free with Prime yeah. or they can buy Rent it. it or so buy it. Do you do you get to what's the back end look like? Do you get to see both all you the do. metrics? You, yeah. Yeah, it's I the metrics aren't like amazing but you do get um you get to see hours streamed you get to see minutes streamed you get to see uh unique users uh over seven days um i think seven days four months or seven months and then 12 months um amazon the, the, the only issue i have and it has been really great so far so i'm not going to complain the only issue mm. i have is is security on amazon as a filmmaker is completely in the hands of the Amazon gods. So uh, recently okay. <laughs> they, they did. Yeah. Cause recently they did a, a giant cull of, of um, independent filmmakers stuff. Um, or just deleted giving, it from the platform. Yeah. They just, yeah. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a group, uh, a Facebook group. That's like Amazon. I can't remember the particular name, but people can find, if they're interested in this because it's it's filmmakers on amazon or independent filmmakers on amazon which is great because people mm. talk about the issues and it became this mm. there was a mass panic that came up because amazon was sending out emails going this item that you've had has been deleted because it doesn't reach our quality checker so maybe they've changed oh, wow. their 
what what they they say is a quality checking thing. Um, mm-hmm. It do not resubmit because it will not go back on. It's like it's been earmarked for not coming Band back. Banned forever. Yeah. Yeah. Now. One of the things I thought was really awesome after the first kind of month of this is I thought, sort of, actually, if you had enough content, you could probably make a decent standard of living as a filmmaker putting your stuff on mm-hmm. Amazon. Because it's all about minutes mm-hmm. streamed. Um, so if you can find a so, decent way so if somebody of, actually, of making actually content, buy it, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. If somebody actually no, it's fine. buys it, do you, do, you yeah. get, do you get the sale or do you still, does it just still just apply for no i do i do i get i get a percent yeah. i get a percentage of the sale a percentage of renting and then it's that minute streamed per pence thing uh, as well I, I although it, Got it. you know looking at it the majority of streamers like it's, it's way more streamers than it is i think it, like purchasing is like not that many and renting yeah is, again, for sure it's, it's very small numbers yeah. but you know most yeah, yeah. people will stream it um yeah, so as I was saying, you can, you can, you know, if you've got enough content on there, you could make a reasonable living out of it, which would be great because that's creative work that you're doing and you're getting paid for. Um, mm-hmm. However, there were people, there were people on this forum who were saying, "Oh, I've got 130 titles, and like, I don't know how you make that many films unless they're all sort of <laughs> rubbish." But yeah, they, yeah. oh, like, 70 of them have been taken off, and it's like that's, and all these people are kind of screaming out, going, "Oh, that's terrible! That's awful!" Uh, I rushed to check webcast. It did have a red flag against it, but it wasn't a quality issue. It was just I put it on as a PG thirteen, and they were like, "This, you know." So they, they clearly done a clean sweep of everything and checked that every, you know, all their ducks, all their ducks were in a row. So I just, yeah. I just wrapped it up to eighteen certificate and said, "Just have it. That doesn't bother me. That's fine." Uh, um, okay. Yeah. But what that means is, is that at any time Amazon could change their rules and bump you off, and it might be that I their s- business model is to yeah. do that. In five years' time, maybe if they do become the ne- the next Netflix or they overtake Netflix, maybe mm-hmm. they will consider the idea that they don't need independent filmmakers anymore, or that mm-hmm. you know the piece of the pie that independent filmmakers are taking is too much for them. Um, or so they make it harder so they, to get in, or yeah, or, or yeah. they'll give you less money. And they've just changed the rules again, which is uh, I can't remember the in particularly but I, it runs a little bit like youtube rules in terms of making money from youtube in that if people stream for the entire length of something you get more money if you stream for a small amount they give you less money and then there's a middle mm-hmm. ground in between so they've they've even tiered the streaming on how so actually that's that's good in the sense of what they want there is quality content because they they realize that people are just picking things up for making loads of stuff doesn't matter what it is, yeah. it's just the duration. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, again, so you are, you know, you're making stuff, but you are just under their rules the whole time in that sense. So, yes. But what's happened with my example is that having it on there has created another opportunity. So mm-hmm. it's definitely mm-hmm. worth doing. It's definitely worth exploring. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, we've been talking for a while, so I think we should probably wrap it up. But wow. yeah. <laughs> um, <is> there... <laughs> um, thank you. It's been it's been a fascinating journey through the whole process from beginning to end, and it sounds like it's not even the end yet. Um, which yeah, is great. It's, great. it's quite the adventure. Um, what's <laughs> what's what's next? What's next? For you? Um, I'm doing um a whole bunch of projects i've got uh going you know different levels and stages as it were i've uh, mm-hmm. started writing some some new stuff i want to make a new feature i think actually though one of the things i really want to do is this whole experience i mean as we've spoken about it today i want i'm going to get that down in video form as well so um, I'm going to i'm going to have a youtube channel to put all that on i think as well mm-hmm. and then i can showcase off my work with that so I'm going to make a, mm-hmm. I'm going to do a plug. If that's all right because I do have a YouTube. Please channel. go, please, please, please. Has my yeah. shorts on it? It's easy. It's Paul does movies. So go to that. Please subscribe. Paul you can see all my movies. Yeah. Paul does movies. Send me and, send me an email um, yes. with this in, and also the link for and so webcast. where we can find webcast. Yes, and I'll absolutely. put it in the link. I'll put it just uh, just under beneath under just beneath this video, so they don't even have to watch the, this far. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. And it'll still yeah. be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. That's so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ben. It was awesome. Just uh, uh, pleasure. No, thank you so much. Yeah. 
Actually, if I sign off with anything, I, I should sign off with the fact that the, the people at Liftoff have been incredibly supportive through that entire journey. And obviously oh, the, the, the enthusiasm for which they received my short actually put me on the journey to making a feature. And then there have been really decent insights into how to do that since then. So I hope other people in this community can use Liftoff in the same way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's the whole. This is the whole point, right? We can all, mm, all yeah. learn from each other and give back. That's it. That's cool. That's cool. And uh, we'll and stay and we'll we'll be talking again. I'm sure very soon. Absolutely. Um, yes. It'll be a pleasure to. And yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Thank <laughs> you. Bye bye. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.